and we're live. It is Tuesday, June 23rd, 2020, 5 o'clock p.m. I am as yet alone on In Lieu of Fun. Kate is late. Our guest is a few minutes late, but that is okay because I have a subject I want to discuss. And to discuss it properly, I want to share my screen. So uh, I want to discuss whether it is possible to measure the cost in lives of bad coronavirus leadership. And I want to do it in a way that's fair because it is impossible to blame Donald Trump for all of the deaths that we have experienced in the United States, for all of the deaths we are going to experience in the United States. And so the question is, how many of them should we attribute to Donald Trump? And I have some thoughts on this, and they relate to our guest today, Thomas Ridd, who is from the country of Germany. And it seems to me that while we cannot expect the United States, which is a big diverse country that is complicated, multi-ethnic and uh, large uh, in, in physical scale and very different from place to place, we shouldn't expect the United States to perform at the level of say South Korea. It is not unreasonable to expect the United States to perform at the level of another large democratic, uh, diverse, multi, uh, uh, multi-ethnic country that uh, has very complex uh, geographic differences, though to be sure not as complex as ours. And so one way to measure the marginal cost of bad government is to measure the difference between the way the United States has performed and the way Germany has performed. Which brings me to the following table, which is the number of cases in each country, according to the New York Times, on a per 100,000 basis. That is to say, per capita. So you'll notice, first of all, that the United States is the only large, really large country in the top tier. Uh, and uh, we have a pretty impressive uh, bunch of uh, number of cases per 100,000, that's 714 with 37 deaths per 100,000. Now, to compare that to Germany, you have to scroll down a pretty long way. Germany, according to the New York Times, has only 230 cases per 100,000 and only 11 deaths per 100,000. But I actually think that involves a calculation error. And here's why. Because if you look at Germany, which is a country of 83 million people, and it has, according to this, 190, 191,000, let's call it 200,000 cases per 100,000 versus the United States, which has 2.2, 2.3 million cases uh, at 330 million people, that is a fourfold difference in population, but uh, something uh, much greater than that, like a, a more than tenfold different in the, in, in the number of cases. Similarly, if you look at the number of deaths, 8.8900 in Germany in a country of uh, 83 million people compared to 120,000. If you multiply that 9,000 by four, you get 36,000. So I actually think the New York Times is... Uh, uh, per capita numbers uh, don't make a lot of sense, but let's leave it aside. Let's just use the raw numbers for now. 2.3 million cases. Uh, let's multiply in Germany. Germany's case nut load by four. 200,000 cases multiplied by four. It would be 800,000 cases. So that's still significantly less than half of the, vo of the case volume. Deaths. 35, 36,000 if you multiply it by four versus 120,000. Uh, guess what? That difference 
the difference between 800,000 and 2.3 million cases and the difference between 35, 36, 40,000 and 120,000, that factor of four difference, that is the price of good government. And I think that is a reasonably fair way of assessing the actual cost in lives of the difference between Angela Merkel's government in Germany and Donald Trump's government in the United States. I think it is maybe maybe rounded off a little bit because Germany is a less complicated country to govern by a bit than the United States. But so maybe say it's only half of the people who have died only half of the people who are going to die that you can attribute to bad leadership. It's still a lot of people. And I think that is the cost in lives of the choices that we have made in governance. Uh, I'd be interested in people's reactions to that. And while I have been ranting on this subject, both my partner in crime, Kate Klonick, and the great Thomas Ridd, native of Germany, which is in honor of which we uh, have used Germany as the example of good governance here, have joined us. We are not allowed to have fun anymore, but in lieu of fun, we're going to discuss Tom Ridd's incredible new book, Active Measures. Tom Ridd, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, thanks. Okay. But you gotta unmute yourself. Um, he is unmuted. I am unmuted. I can hear him. Because a silent Tom Ridd no. on the show no, ben. is like having, oh, ben. you can do a mime. But I can't hear you. <laughs> ben, your, um, your, your speaker's not working, Ben. Can you Whoa. hear us, ben? I'll, Can I'm nobody hear me? Yeah, can you guys is, hear no me? No one can hear him. No, we, we can hear you. Uh-oh. You we, can't mm -hmm. hear us. Wait a minute. <laughs> oh, the audience says they hear all of us. Uh, so... Uh, can you guys hear each other? Yes. Yes. So you can hear each other. So Kate, you start talking uh, <laughs> and uh, Tom, you start talking and I'm going to figure out what's wrong with my audio. I mean, you can ask us questions. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Tom, it's so nice to meet you. I'm sorry I was late. I've never been late to the show. Um, I was doing another panel on online speech. Um, it's late, uh, but it's so good to have you. And I've heard so much about your book. I have not read it yet, but this is going to be, I'm very much looking forward to discussing it. Where are you located right now? I'm in, I'm in Georgetown in Washington. Oh, nice. I can hear you guys now. Oh, good. Nice. Welcome, Ben. <laughs> I was wondering why. Here we I was, go. Hi, Ben. Hello. Like when this, when like you were going through your, your, um, your New York Times statistics, like I wasn't getting any response. I was like, yeah, you know, I thought, <laughs> I thought Kate is being so, uh, so uh, uh, deferential and, <laughs> um, you know, like this is the longest uh, any of us has ever talked without an interruption. And it never <laughs> occurred to me that's because I couldn't hear you. <laughs> um, anyways, it's so good to have you on the show, Thomas. Um, and you're coming in from Georgetown and you have this great new book that Ben is, uh, is going to uh, talk about and introduce you. We have, um, I think, a few things on the agenda for today. Um, and uh, I will just, Ben, do you want to go ahead and introduce our panelist? I will, I will, I will uh, say a few words about Tom. So first of all, Tom was one of the people who I think it's fair to say is one of the only people who really understood in real time the Russian electoral interference. And uh, why don't we, like Tom is a political scientist, you're now based at SICE in Washington. He's the author, as I say, of Active Measures, which is an, a truly amazing history of, of information operations, particularly of the Eastern Bloc variety. Um, How'd you get into this area? Well, first of all, thanks for the uh, generous introduction. I mean, I really got into the, um, I, w I got into the specific history of disinformation and active measures as a response to the election interference. And in fact, you know, we're talking at an interesting time. It's the 23rd of June, 
um, the entire story became public pretty much exactly um, four years ago on the 15th and 16th of June. And the Gutcher for Two account was created and a little earlier on the 8th of June when the um, DC leaks account became online, these front uh, accounts for Russian military intelligence. And, and I remember very well um, obsessively following this activity on uh, online um, at the time because it was clear from day one uh, just shortly after Dmitry Alperovich had put out this post on CrowdStrike uh, and the Washington Post had covered the DNC hack, it was clear from day one that this is um, um, pretty highly likely a Russian uh, destruction maneuver. And, I mean, you and want... when you say it's clear, it was clear from day one, why was it clear? So it was clear because the forensic indicators that CrowdStrike had published about the DNC breach were, were very strong. So the, there was very little doubt, no doubt really, that we're looking at a Russian government attempt to hack the DNC. And then the way the, um, the next question was, how about the leak? Is the leak sourced from this hack? So is Gucci for two who they claim to be this Romanian hacker or is, is it really a front? Um, account. And for those of us who watched the recent uh, lead up to 2016, we knew that there were Russian front organizations out there. Cyber Caliphate, you know, was never an, a, an IS group. It was a Russian front group. And we knew that already um, at the time. So there are a couple of different incidents like that. So we expected a lot of us, uh, I don't use the first person because it wasn't just me. It was many people in this community watching this closely. A lot of us thought, okay, this is just looks like another one of those uh, front groups. And um, and yeah, so it wasn't that hard to, to guess, actually. So you, unlike a lot of people, responded to this by doing this history of active measures, uh, which I have to say I found really eye-opening that the, in light of your book, I have to say nobody should have been remotely surprised that the Russians wanted to get involved in our elections in 2016. In fact, it kind of would have been surprising given their history that had they not. How did the Russians come to have such a fascination with information operations and why did it persist as a, a kind of Russian a, and in your account, Czech and uh, uh, Bulgarian sort of specialty, East, East German specialty that, whereas it kind of didn't function that way in the West? Yeah, that's a great question, um, but let me just, because it fits in, make another quick observation on the on the meaning of that history uh, of the. So when you know when I followed the events in 2016, four years ago, and literally exactly four years ago, I had already started writing. Like you know, at that point in time, one week later, I had already started writing my first investigative sort of detailed piece on the forensics pointing to GRU, which then later appeared in Motherboard uh, uh, in June. Excuse me, in July, and. It was clear, so I was able to understand the forensic aspects and the recent history of front organizations, but I didn't really appreciate the depth of the history then. And the more I looked into the his history, the more everything fell into place, the more credible and the more, I mean, it suddenly it was the more, what was more eye-opening for me, the history or the forensics? And the answer is clearly the history. I mean, you cannot read this history and then it just shapes the interpretation of the entire body of evidence that we have today. So I can literally only laugh at the conspiracy theory that is still conspira 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 conspiracy theorists still out there questioning the evidence. Um, uh, rather not go down that rabbit hole here. So yeah, let's not. To, let's let's stay on Earth. Yeah, let's. Um, but to your question. Um, why was the East, broadly speaking, 
developing so differently from the West when we talk about influence operations, active measures? And it's a great question. And I thought about it for a long time, which is why I included three long and in my view, three of the most extraordinary chapters in the book are on CIA operations. Yep. CIA, by the way, just recently reviewed the book for its internal in-house journal um, and also uh, briefly mentioned and uh, pointed to those uh, CIA operations in the 50s because they weren't that different from Russian active measures and Soviet active measures, and East German active measures at the time. But of course, they became very different, the Western response, as we move into the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And I think the big ticket, the short sort of pithy answer is Active measures are the weapon, a weapon of the weak. They're a weapon of the desperate. They're a weapon of authoritarian societies and systems, not of open democracies. So you can't be good at disinformation and democracy at the same time. Can so, you talk a little bit? Oh, go ahead then. Please go ahead, Kate. Oh, I'm just curious what those, I haven't read your book yet, but I'm, could you talk a little bit about what those active measures by, perpetrated by the, the CIA were, the ones, the three that you thought were most significant? Yeah, so the, the, the term that CIA used at the time was political warfare, hence the subtitle of the book, and psychological uh, operations or psychological warfare. And the one that I'm particularly excited about, because I'm the first person to write about this outside CIA, is the front group known as PR Office Kramer, later Equator Publishing, the cryptonym was Elsie LC, LC Kassock. And this, this was a, f a group that was run by a very talented former Nazi uh, Wehrmacht uh, um, officer. By the, his name was Marbach, who was a very dynamic individual and very excellent at what he did. And uh, he ran this forgery factory for CIA. They were putting out false magazines, pamphlets, even letters um, to harass the East German uh, system, ultimately, a jazz magazine. A, you know, even a dating service. It was a woman's magazine. It was an extraordinary uh, spree of testing, really. To what end? Like, I mean, was it just disruption? To uh, spread freedom. To sp you know, this is the 1950s. It's a very different decade, very different age. The, the ambitions are through the roof. Think of the space race beginning slowly at the end of the decade. Um, so, uh, or even earlier, depending on how you look at it. And, uh, and I think, you know, reading those CIA memos, you're like, oh my God, they really thought they could like spread freedom through jazz. But I think that's the 1950s for you. So there was recently a podcast released um, by Spotify uh, and others uh, by the uh, investigative New Yorker journalist, uh, Patrick Radden Keefe, who's uh, best known for having written uh, a truly wonderful book about the uh, the troubles and and uh, IRA disappeared uh, persons in Northern Ireland, but the examination in this and it made me think of you because the basic thesis is that not only well the the question that the podcast examines is whether the CIA was responsible for the promotion of or even the writing of the uh, rock song Wind of Change by the German group, the Scorpions, which became a kind of anthem of the fall of the Berlin Wall period, particularly in behind the Berlin Wall. Um, but the along the way, there is a, um, a an argument that uh, Keith makes that the, uh, the the era of information operations by the CIA did not end in the 50s and that in fact using music and pop culture as a means of 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 uh, talking directly to the people of uh, of of the Soviet bloc uh, really did continue and continued through people like Louis Armstrong and Nina Simone and uh, ultimately uh, through maybe uh, through the Scorpions. So my question is, uh, first of all, do you buy, it, it, 
I, I mean, let me lay my cards on the table. If Winds of Change was a CIA information operation, I think it's a great one. Nobody died. Nobody, no one was lied to. Nobody, uh, it doesn't raise any concerns for me. It, it just actually seems like a wonderful thing. But um, although I hate the song, um, uh, do you believe that the CIA in fact dropped active measures and how should we understand stories like the one Patrick Radden Keefe is exploring? Do we, are we doing spoiler alert warnings or not going there? Uh, I have no trouble being a spoiler. Uh, okay. He's released the whole thing. Uh, yeah. uh, I, you know, if, if say whatever you want to say. Yeah. So um, the Pat podcast, first of all, uh, just his book, Say Nothing, is a masterpiece. Uh, it is I a masterpiece. Can, uh, extraordinary book. One of my favorite books of all times, absolutely. Um, the podcast and the story, I mean, I was not really convinced that it is a CIA operation. I'm leaning more against it than in favor of it. And he, I think, got the feeling that he's also reserving judgment. Um, but more important, let's, so let's run for, for a moment with the assumption that CIA had some form of uh, role in spreading the song Winds of Change, the Scorpions uh, hit. i um, very familiar with it from my own time in Berlin, um, actually. Uh, I don't think it was the same type of, you know, it's, there's no forgery in there. Even if they didn't reveal their hand, you could count it as an influence operation in theory. But, but I think we have to be in a position, and this is a really important aspect here, to appreciate the different types of uh, intelligence operations that types of covert action here in this context. Some of them just cross lines that democracies should not cross. So for example, one of the stories in the book is KGB uh, engineering a racial anti-Semitic um, hate campaign in 1959, 1960 in Germany and beyond, including here in the United States in 15 different cities. That operation was brutally effective because there was obviously a real anti-Semitic problem, anti-Semitic undercurrent that 14 years after the Holocaust that you could tap into really just like today. I mean, not just like today, but comparable today to today. And they did. So remarkable here is that obviously this is a no-go for any Western liberal democracy, you know, exacerbating anti-Semitism anti even among your adversary society. But it was even a no-go for Markus Wolf, for the head of the Stasi's foreign intelligence arm, because he, his own family had, um, he had own Jewish uh, family members, and he thought, uh, he apparently made that call, he alludes to that in his memoirs, that he didn't want to be part of that operation. That's an extraordinary uh, thing. So what, con what, when you think of the active measures that you're describing, that you're the history of which you're talking about in this book, it's not limited to forgeries. It's not limited because a lot of what the IRA was doing was not forgeries. They were, you know, saying things that posing as people whom they weren't. Um, but with, but you know, a lot of the things that they were saying were true or at least reasonable opinions resonant with many things that many people in the United States agree with. What was fraudulent was their identification. Yeah. And so I, I guess I, I, what characterizes the history, let's define terms. When you say active measures, what do you, what's in and what's out? If the scorpions are out, yeah. How do you define the line? No, I think actually if the Scorpions were um, a CIA operation, I mean, the song specifically, then that I think would count. Uh, active measure, of course, is a term of art that was used by Soviet intelligence for a, for a long time between 19, early 1960 and late 1980. Um, it's no, no longer in use, but it's helpful. It's a good term. I like it because it does something for us conceptually. Active measures work by activating an emotional reaction. And whether the 
vehicle that you use in order to achieve that activation is factually correct or factually not correct is ultimately not the most decisive component. In practice, it was often to a significant degree uh, tapping into existing factually correct um, documents or you know, situations. Uh, so the punchline that I'm developing in the book is that active measures have become more active and less measured over time. And that more active component began already in the 1970s. It's not just the internet. It's really the rise of activism in liberal democracies as a sort of organized grassroots of, you know, uh, force that, that develops along really with personal computers. That's probably a little bit of a coincidence, but the early 1980s, late 1970s are an interesting time period here. Can you say a little bit more about, I can see what you mean by more active, um, but I'm not quite, I'm having trouble picturing what you mean by less measured. Yeah, so um, the, less, the less measured part is, you know, two components. One, it's harder to pull back once the once an operation has developed um, a life of its own. It's hard to control it for the for the originators, but also less less measured in the fact in the, in the sense that in the context of social media campaigns or even hack and leak campaigns today, it's just really really hard to measure impact from again from the operator's point of view. There are many examples in the book of. Uh, intelligence agencies trying to measure and to assess, to evaluate the effect of an operation. It's a fraught undertaking because by definition, you are exacerbating an existing uh, friction or situation. So how do you draw the line between what you did and what was organically happening in the first place? It's very difficult to do. It's difficult to do for the perpetrators, for the you know, engineers of an operation, but also for the victim. And I think we haven't done very well, actually, in sober in assessing the effect of this Russian operation in, in the most sober and fact-based fashion that doesn't talk them up and makes them bigger, more influential, and more powerful than they really are. Yeah, so let's talk about that. Um, if you were doing a, an after-action report for the Russians, uh, about the effectiveness of that operation, uh, or for that matter, the effectiveness of their history of active measures as you describe it in the book. Is it, what does it accomplish for them in a tangible fashion? And how much of it is just, as you describe, the less powerful being able to say to themselves, well, we really fucked them on, on X or Y. And, and uh, that, that is sort of the, the fact that we're still talking about this after, after three and a half years, that is the strategic impact, not the election of Donald Trump. Yeah, absolutely, yes. I couldn't agree more. I have no doubt just based on case files that are read in, in, in archives or archival material that they would include, you know, the equivalent of newspaper clippings uh, today. So a summary of press stories about their operation, um, documents that came out of government, uh, even the special counsel's office that uh, portray their operation as successful. That would be included in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an assessment. And uh, in, to some degree, we have written very impressive after action reviews for them. We've give, yeah. given them fine material to work with. Yes, we have. One, one thing that I think they would find difficult to handle, um, just playing, you know, getting into their mind a little bit here, is the exaggeration of IRA impact, the Internet Research Agency. We should be specific, given that we just talked about saying nothing here. Um, the Internet Research Agency, I think, was vastly overestimated in its impact. And think about it this way. If you're sitting in GRU and the first indictment that the special counsel is putting out is the um, IRA indictment, um, which probably also contributed to overstating their impact because it also looked at data that were generated post-election, not just pre-election, you're kind of, you, I'm sure some of them must have been at least uh, disappointed, if not angry, at these bumbling 
contractors at the IRA that really didn't do very well, but somehow got so much attention, also because Facebook really messed up early on. Do you think that, so that, I just want to make one comment and then uh, go ahead, Ben, you can ask your question. My, no, 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 go ahead. Um, so I have this, um, everything you're saying is just seems like straight up psychology to me psychology over the the people that the that these that these active measures are targeted against psychology of of what they get back in terms of feedback or impact just kind of it, like the payoff isn't even necessarily has to be true it almost just has to be affirming of their own superiority in some way um and so it just strikes me as just this this very twisted game and to that ex i mean which it is obviously um but what what i've been perplexed by and maybe you can finally be the person and i do a lot with internet speech um but maybe you can be finally be the person that kind of answers this for me i've never understood the memes that go around that are just images um like really like lissy images that are just kind of like saying something like do these things to stop like you know stop body fat or stop hillary clinton mm -hmm. or uh you know not get cancer stop eating sugar or whatever whatever they are some of them seem attached in some way to some could be attached to some type of politics. Some of them seem like they could be attached to some type of industry or private company or something like that. But some of them are just purely nonsense, like false nonsense. Like, mm -hmm. and the example that I'll use that was really early on was like the Neiman Marcus Toll House cookie recipe. I don't know if you remember that, but like there's these chain mails that proliferate that don't really seem to have like this impact. The wind of change seems like that to me. These these examples seem like that to me. I don't know how you could possibly track the spread of these um, mm -hmm. th over the internet. So I'm just like, what is, what is, is that all about the psychology of, of people, um, of people that are putting those out into the world? Or is that they, they just want to see, they just kind of want to mess with things like trolls or is it there, is there more? Like, I'm just kind of curious. So we know from the archives that active measures operators were trained and um, were trained to be watching out for cultural trends that could be exploited. You know, the the famous uh, AIDS is an American bioweapon myth. Um, it appears to be uh, the, the idea, KGB got the idea to spread this uh, operation from gay activist circles in uh, Boston and New York, as far as we can reconstruct. So that was part and parcel of how they ran these operations. Have people on the ground who have an eye on cultural currents and then tap into them, help amplify. Uh, something like that probably continues uh, on the internet today. I mean, that's pretty obvious, but of course, um, for them, it's also a challenge to, I mean, there's also a lot of organic uh, activity which leads us back to that larger question. How do you distinguish between your own? So one of the things about your book that really interested me was how old this active measures tradition is. And, and in some ways, it seems like it develops kind of out of the kind of common turn uh, effort to I mean, the, the early Soviet government wasn't simply interested in conducting espionage. It was, uh, it was interested in overthrowing all governments in the world, right? And so a certain, a, a certain and they were supporting communist parties in every, everywhere, basically, that mattered in the world. And so the, this idea that they would be kind of actively involved in the information politics of all these other countries is more is is a little bit more intuitive than say that the French government would care what was what was being said in the United States even about subjects unrelated to France how do you understand the origins of the kind of Czechist uh, fascination with information operations it, where does it come from Mm. Yeah, that's a fascinating question. Um, 
that, of course, requires a lot of deep understanding of Russian um, history um, pre revolution, which I don't have. So I want to want to be upfront about on my own limitations to answer this question. But it appears to me from what I've read, that the uh, indeed the global ambition of the uh, of the revolution um, is was was an was an important driver of active measures as well, because they're ultimately a consequence of the vision of the of the communist, you know, global um, uh, vision for revolution. And so you have this, you, and I think that's a really important consideration that the ideological power of early active measures is clearly linked to communism. And then what happens in the 50s and 60s is that as communism loses some of its ideological appeal internally, and you know people start making jokes about communism, even inside the security establishment, you have this cynicism that is creeping in. And the cynicism uh, in some ways makes them even better at active measures because they're now able to see, to play this multi-level game, to have a conversation in public and a conversation in private that may not overmatch with each other. And of course, the, the the this this learned culture of tolerating contradiction is helpful in spotting contradiction among your adversaries and exploiting it. We have a question from the big blue blogger who needs to unmute himself before he asks it. Hello, Ben. Uh, great show as always, and one wonderful guest after another. Uh, Thomas, vielen Dank für Ihre Arbeit. Big fan, won't do the fanboy thing. I wanted to turn our attention to 2020 a little bit and ask you, um, in rough order, which of these threats or risks is depriving you of the most sleep for November? Um, disinformation, data exfiltration, data integrity or modification, denial of service, or are they all too interrelated for you to separate them, or maybe something else? Yeah. Um, what, what the the scariest scenario for 2020 is a combination of uh, the president um, calling into question the legitimacy of the election and a foreign entity helping him in the process of calling the legitimacy of the election into question. Um, I think they wouldn't actually have to be very successful um, necessarily at uh, hacking a specific system or bringing down a system, but only need to be able in a very compressed time scale in a moment of high anxiety and stress to credibly get across that that something didn't go as well as it should have. And of course, the, the risk is then that the Trump campaign would amplify um, that type of external interference. But again, I want to stress that you know, I'll put it in provocative terms. Weak democracies blame outside forces for things that go wrong at home. Russia does that. Strong democracies own their problems and fix them. So the more we talk about Russian disinformation, the more space this conversation occupies. And again, this is becoming more of an issue as we move into the election. The more we fall into the, into the pattern of a weak democracy. Speaking of which, I want to talk to you about your Czech friend. Um, one of the things about this book that I think is just incredible is the amount of firsthand archival work that you did, as well as these interviews. And, uh, you know, you spent a lot of time with, I don't know what to call them, practitioners of the dark arts. So, Tell us about them, like, uh, and and about your conversations with this gentleman. Yeah, so in, in March uh, 2017, I was invited to testify in front of the um, uh, Senate uh, Intelligence Committee on the, that was early before the Mueller investigation even had begun, to present the evidence that pointed to Russian um, interference. And at the time, I was already well into this book and uh, was doing my research uh, on the history. And I knew that one of the, perhaps the single most impressive individual still alive um, on disinformation and its history, Ladislav Bittman or Lawrence um, Martin, as he called himself later, 
um, was, was in Rockport, Massachusetts. So I emailed him. I was able to pull up his email just on, off Google and uh, introduced myself and said, I'd love to meet you. And at the time, he, there was not as much interest um, as there was later in his work. So he said, immediately said yes and said, sure, come by and we'll, um, we'll talk. Uh, so I did. I, came, I visited him. It was a very cold day, uh, sunny. Um, no, not sunny, actually. It was just cold out there in Rockport. And he was just uh, extraordinary. I was, you know, he was, um, he had written two books, um, testified, taught at Boston Col College and Boston University, I think, um, about this inf disinformation. So he, he had done it in practice. And he had uh, reflected on it more than most people at the time. And uh, I was just so impressed by him on a personal level. You could see that if you put a creative mind like his at work, um, that uh, you know people will come up, operators will come up with really impressive ideas. Um, I described this operation in the book, Neptune, where, that he designed and I read his memos um, in the archives that he didn't have, have access to actually at the time when he wrote about it just extraordinary what he did and tell us about it yeah so tease neptune was tease people's interest in the book yeah neptune uh, doesn't need much uh selling it's he had the idea you know there was this hunt for nazi gold underway in in the alps in 1963 i mean it was a happened in the summer it was a deep alpine lake you know beautiful lake and of course, this was a great story, finding Nazi gold potentially in this lake. Globally, yeah, everybody wrote about it, even here in the United States. So he was sitting in Prague watching this and they're like, hmm, that's so interesting. The Nazis are about to, uh, excuse me, the Germans are about to, um, the, the statute of limitations of war crimes in Germany is about to expire. We have Nazi documents in our archives because we used to be occupied by Nazis and were then liberated. Why don't we, drop these Nazi documents into a lake, have them discovered by press, just like what's going on right now in the Alps. We also have beautiful lakes and mountains um, and then have a huge story and put pressure on the Germans. So that's how the whole operation began. Andy McMahon, the floor is yours. Unmute yourself, please. You got to click that unmute thing. There you go. All right, sorry about that. I was doing the dishes, but here I am. Um, so my 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 question. Um, so I'm confused about what would separate uh, active measures from the sort of incidents that you can find earlier um, in European history. So one example I'm thinking of is James the Second. Um, and his wife gave birth to a healthy baby boy. Somebody started a successful rumor that the baby had been smuggled in on a bedpan. Um, and then William and Mary come next um, and are invited to take the throne. So it was a very successful operation of some kind. Um, I'm just, I'm interested as to whether you would call that kind of rumor mongering an active measure um, or if it falls short. Yeah. I mean, I had to make difficult call, a difficult cause about what to include and what not to include. Um, so clearly, you know, we could go back to the Bible, which arguably contains disinformation and active measures as well. Um, but I didn't want to go there. So the decision that I made is I'm just going to look at modern intelligence agencies that professionalize the use of deception um, and, uh, and talk about those operations, not earlier European or other examples That's, that would just be yeah, difficult to contain in one book. I also ex decided to exclude, sorry, Ben. I mean, isn't part of the distinction it, it, uh, that you're trying to influence public opinion um, rather than say collect intelligence, you're trying to influence public opinion rather than to, uh, for example, misinform policy leaders and make them do X rather than Y. It's actually an effort to uh, shape the political culture by injecting false information or true information potentially into the public bloodstream. 
Not necessarily. I mean, in practice, most of the time, because the target societies were democracies almost always here. And there, of course, if you influence public opinion, you will, and published opinion, you will at some point influence, ideally, political decisions. But we have examples of uh, very impressive operations going directly after political decision makers without the public route, so to speak, like the failed um, vote of no confidence against Willy Brandt in 1972, the German chancellor. The Stasi operation shaped the outcome. None of this became public. What is the what is the cost of in of internet um, active measures like in the last election versus in preceding types of similar maneuvers are they are they less expensive are they more expensive? Yeah, the, it's probably um, you probably need more preparation. You needed more preparation, more resourcing, more creativity, more planning, really in uh, in the Cold War. Because the target, the main target group that you try to um, chain, try to really deceive, were journalists, and of course, um, ideally, journalists working for important big newspapers or TV stations. And in order to trick them, you just need some quality material. Um, today, it's easier to uh, surface material or to shape social media conversations, you might, you may not have great impact, but it's easier to sort of start. Uh, the startup costs are lower. I want to ask you about uh, the politics of your, your, your point about the, the desire to, you know, have us turn outward and, and, blame our problems on external sources because I, I I think that's a, a critical if you go to any country uh, where you know governance is really deeply mistrusted there are always conspiracy theories about outside actors you know whether it's I don't know Egypt or Pakistan or right like you go to a place where people have, deep reason or Russia, deep reason to mistrust government. And there are always conspiracy theories about, about outside actors, ra in addition to their conspiracy theories about internal actors, and they tend to be intertwined. So how much of the active measure fixation is influenced by the belief that outside actors are doing exactly that sort of thing to them. In other words, is there an element of it that is we're doing to the other side what we assume they are doing to us? Vladimir Putin clearly believes that the protests in Moscow that were a CIA, were a CIA operation and that Hillary Clinton was responsible for them and saw these in some way as a kind of response to that. How much of this is that sort of thing? And how much of it is just, it's the trade craft of, the, of, the, of, of that community? I think it really depends on what side of the equation, what, on what side we're trying to understand what's going on, on the Russian or Soviet side, historically speaking, or East German side, or Czech or Slovak side, or on the side of the West in the United States today or you know historically as well. Because I think running disinformation operations in the Cold War at that scale, it was a really important you know, activity of the Soviet establishment, just in terms of resourcing and the amount of operations they put out. It's a low trust, it, it reduces trust in your system even further. So it's, 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 it's more effective, it's a low trust, um, uh, activity that that is you know taking root in in authoritarian uh, systems uh, that's a historical trend that we seem to be able to see but it makes them sort of even less trustworthy on the inside so for example you have these memos that don't distinguish between true and false at all your partner agency tells you to do something but they don't tell you what is the forgery and what is real like the checks for example um, didn't know which of the Nazi documents that they would receive from Moscow were forgeries as opposed to actual Nazi documents. 
um, it's really bizarre when you start looking at the, at the details here. And why is this so important? Because they will ultimately start believing in their own, they will find it very difficult to distinguish between their own conspiracy theories that are engineered and um, ascribing, essentially projecting mirror imaging that into the adversary. So I, I some of the, uh, I remember I talked to a former Stasi disinformation officer and he was convinced that we're looking at a symmetric situation that CIA and MS6 were just doing the same thing. And I don't think he was playing me when he said that. He really believed that. No, so I think, I, I think that I'm, I'm, I'm sure of that. I think when you listen to Putin talk about uh, how much of domestic Russian politics is conditioned by the intervention of foreign actors, it is, I, I mean, it, it is amazing. I, I, and I think he probably really believes it. Yeah. Totally. Kate, sorry, I interrupted you. No, I was going to say the same thing that I completely believe it. So it's almost an epistemological question of like, what is truth? The perception of, of, of facts or the facts themselves? And is there such a thing as the underlying facts or the underlying truth? Like if it's all just perception and you think that something is, it becomes it becomes the perceived social social um, understanding uh, because you perpetuate the lies so much and you, you come to believe it, then I just don't, I don't know if that there's a distinction. And that's, it actually is kind of this interesting irony of your book, right? Which is that there's, if you're writing this story that's all about the role of active measures in disinformation or kind of, or creating that type of fake news, there is, as you kind of are saying that like, that we undermine ourselves by building up the hype around it thus kind of ensuring that there it's actually a more su successful campaign than it really otherwise would have been do you think that your book builds the hype around the the, the concern or do you think it it you think it effectively kind of neuters like this and brings some truth to this uh to the conversation i mean i became paranoid writing the book that i would overstate or understate the effect of disinformation and by doing either of the two that I would become a useful idiot myself, you know, decades after the fact, or indeed four years after the fact. I love um, that. So, I think that's such a great impulse though. That's such a smart <laughs> impulse and human, like humble one. I think that that's great. But let's look at 2016 again for just a moment, because I think the intellectually most interesting situation we have in the United States right now, and we had it here for the past couple of years, because we have a temptation on the, on the left center, cent left of center, to blame Trump on the Russians. We, the, essentially, the argument is the Russian election interference moved the needle and is partly, if not fully, responsible for this president. It's an emotional, very emotionally tempting conclusion. On the right, you have the opposite situation. This is actually a nice sort of bipartisan symmet symmetry here, or partisan, if you like, symmetry here. On the right, you have the opposite temptation that this is all a hoax and that there's no substance to the story. And both, in my mind, are not uh, fully supported by the facts. Clearly, the, the latter, latter is, is less supported by the facts. But an honest, hard look at the data of what we saw in 2016, in my ex estimation, does not allow a only a, doesn't allow a high confidence assessment of what happened. So we, to put it bluntly, it's an unknowable fact if the Russian election interference actually moved the needle in 2016 or not. And because it is an unknowable fact, we can argue neither strongly for nor strongly against it, which leaves us hanging with this really unpleasant dilemma because we have to make a call of judgment collectively. Do we tend to say, do we collectively agree to say they had an impact, the election interference had an impact on the outcome of the 2016 election? If we do so, we make an ethical decision about, and we make a decision about how we handle this uncertainty, whether we want to blame outside forces or ourselves. And I would err on the side of blaming ourselves because that's who I want to be. It's what you can, am, it's, the only, it's the only thing you can, can control. I am so with you on that for a completely different reason than the one you articulated, which is that if, 
If there is a but for causation for Russian intervention on behalf of Trump, it occurred at the margins, right? It it got it it caused a swing of, in the best scenario, some few tens of thousands of votes, and in Michigan in 2016, that was enough, right? There is still the problem of 45% of the American population that voted that way, irrespective of Russian involvement. And, and so, yes, you can say in the best scenario for active measures, it affected the margins in a fashion that may have been decisive. I actually personally don't think that's likely to be true, but no. as you say, you ca it cannot be demonstrated one way or the other. Um, that I'm much more concerned about the core than I am at the margins, which is also the reason why I don't really blame Hillary Clinton for what happened. I don't blame Jim Comey for what happened. I don't blame the Russians for what happened. The fundamental problem is that 40 plus percentage of Americans are a sufficiently attracted to an undemocratic set of propositions and an authoritarian set of propositions that we have a very serious problem. I'm much more concerned about the core of that problem than I am about the marginal factors that may push that into victory versus defeat. Of course, I'm concerned about that, I'm much more concerned about how do you knock 7% off of that 40%? What are the big chunks of that that we can return to the democratic fold? Tony Kava, I think you get the last question today. Oh, well, thanks for bringing me in. Um, my question would be, I guess it kind of wraps things up a bit, but um, what do you see as the responsibility of new and old media to avoid disseminating disinformation whether it's from Russia or China or otherwise, like what does the New York Times, what's their, what are they responsible to do next time they get a tranche of stolen email? And then kind of the corollary, if I'm using that word right to that is what responsibilities do consumers of information have going forward? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I would, I'll keep it simple because we don't have a lot of time left, but one expect forgeries. The historical pattern is very clear. Forgeries are almost always part of this type of operational activity. Um, and I, I don't just mean front organizations that pretend to be somebody else, but straight up forgeries. But of course, also the other more subtle forgeries about, about provenance and fronts. So uh, that's one thing I would say. And the other one is uh, just uh, be honest about the sourcing. Uh, if there are these edge cases, but they will remain edge cases that you as a journalist will be receiving information from an anonymous leak or somebody who you can't really establish where they got the information from. And you, you're suspecting that this could be professionally sourced through an intelligence agency or could be some form of active measure or disinformation operation. You have to, and if it's of high news value and passes your extra thorough fact checking to get you know, to handle these forgeries, potential forgeries. So if it passes muster on the fact-checking front, you will still have to disclose, I think that's an ethically clear-cut case, you will have to disclose that it is could be and potentially likely is from an adversarial intelligence agency. That I think is a major ethical lapse if the disclosure, especially after 2016, if that disclosure is not part of the reporting. Tom Ridd. Uh, the book is Active Measures. I don't have it right on me, so I don't remember the exact subtitle. Remind us. Uh, the Secret, um, my publisher really liked The Secret there, History yes. of um, Active of Disinformation and Political Warfare. Uh, I, I'm really excited to read this book now. <laughs> I, Thank you. You are now like the 12th person who I've gone out and bought the book. I'm like the, <laughs> I'm, I'm the, I get suckered every time. But uh, and that which is a perfect metaphor for today. <laughs> but the, I'm assuming this is the real thing. So I'm so Thank glad you. that you're writing about this. Thank you. I cannot recommend this book highly enough. Um, I also for enough. those for those who want more information uh, in oral form on the book, uh, Tom did a lengthy two part uh, interview with the Lawfare podcast 
uh, one part with Quinta Jurassic and the other part with Jack Goldsmith uh, that we ran a couple months ago now. Uh, uh, but it actually walks through a bunch of the uh, elements of the book, both historically and, and in a more contemporary fashion. Uh, so please uh, uh, check it out. And um, uh, we will be uh, on Thursday in a contemporary active measure uh, matter. We will have Camille Francois, uh, who has just produced a report on a current Russian active measure uh, of a kind of internet research agency sort of variety and a uh, great uh, pairing to think about that in light of the history that Tom talked about today. So thank you for joining us. And Kate, you. what's going on tomorrow? Because we've got like tomorrow is is the day that it's finally happening. I know. At long last, we are joined by Jonathan Zittrain. Very excited. At, from Harvard Law School, he will be a tremendous guest. Um, and he's a wonderful person and has been is a great mentor to me. And he's just been wonderful. So I'm very much looking forward to it. But we have bumped him from the show like three times. Yeah. He, he is the person <laughs> who has been scheduled and bumped. Uh, and it is not in any sense a reflection on him more than anyone else. Or how much we else. like him. <laughs> yeah. So join us tomorrow at five. Uh, uh, and until then, what do uh, we say? Uh, we don't have fun anymore. So in lieu of fun, come hang out with us and don't listen. Don't believe everything you read. Yeah, because some of it may have been forged and dumped in a lake. Exactly. <laughs> I, See for you one, tomorrow. I'm in search of Nazi 